Welcome to season four of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former Commissioner of Health in Baltimore City. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to current topics in public health through engaging interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health On Call. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks to Emily Gurley, an infectious disease epidemiologist at Johns Hopkins. As we enter a new year in the pandemic, they discuss whether our strategies to prevent COVID-19 are working and talk about reallocating resources to focus specifically on those at risk for hospitalization and death. Let's listen. Emily Gurley, thanks so much for joining me. It's such a pleasure. Thank you. So I wanted to talk today about what happens in 2022. So what is uh, sort of the next phase of our COVID strategy and how should we really be thinking about this as we move on? Well, I, you know, I think what it looks like depends on us. I think our, our current approach to COVID so far has been to do whatever we can to prevent as many infections as possible. And you know, this has, we've done this through um, uh, behavior change, masking, social distancing, through vaccinations, uh, contact tracing. Those have all, these are all mainstays of our current approach. But I would argue that going into 2022, um, we might rethink what our public health goal is. And I say this for a number of reasons. So the the approaches we have now, again, they're focused on preventing as many infections as possible. But there's no defined goal. So when have we met our goal, right? There's no real accountability there because we don't know really what we're aiming at. The second limitation of our our current approach is that it's, it's very costly in terms of resources, in terms of time, in terms of our mental bandwidth. And and I'm talking about uh, public health as well as the communities that we serve. Essentially, now we have no focus per se. It's on preventing as many infections as possible writ large across our populations. But that demands a a lot of resources, time, and energy, which I I fear it's not sustainable. And I fear that, again, because there's no real end goal that we've agreed on, We lose people along the way because we ask so much. And there's a lot of collateral damage there. When um, we still have kids who miss a lot of school, people have lost their jobs because of these strategies. So we have to take that into account. And, And I think that one of the main reasons that we are trying to prevent as many infections as possible is to prevent hospitalizations and deaths those have really taken a toll uh, here in the U.S., and it's um, you know we we have broad agreement that those are those are bad outcomes that we want to prevent. So what I would argue is maybe a shift in in our thinking so that we we make that the explicit goal: preventing hospitalizations and deaths. Um, because I think if we do that, you know, we can come up with explicit, quantifiable uh, public health goals. We have to have the discussion. COVID COVID is never going away. How many hospitalizations and deaths can we accommodate? How many are we willing to accept? We do this with other infectious diseases and and probably the time has come to have that discussion about COVID as well. And then if we set those goals through difficulty, right? Through difficult conversation, I'm, I'm not suggesting this is easy. But if we have those explicit goals, then we can set up strategies to get there. And we know whether or not we're meeting our goals, right? Because they're explicitly defined. And there may even be multiple pathways to those goals. So there are, you know, different states, for example, may have uh, different pathways to, to reach their goal. I think if we were really focused on that goal per se, it would change 
how, how we use our finite resources. So in practice, what does that look like? Um, well, I have some, I have a few ideas, uh, about what we might do differently. First, there are treatments for COVID. We know who's at highest risk for hospitalization and death, right? So, th- so as a first approach, if, if that's really what we want to prevent hospitalizations and deaths, then we really focus in on people who are at high risk for hospitalization and death. That includes people without pre-existing immunity. Many of those, so people who are unvaccinated and may never have been infected either. We know from hospitalization data, most people hospitalized now have not been vaccinated. So how do we reach those populations? How do we get them access to monoclonal antibody therapies that can drastically reduce their risk of hospitalization? At the time we're recording this, uh, in December, antiviral therapies are not widely available, but they will be coming. How do we maximize access and and potential of those treatments for people who are at highest risk for hospitalization and death? So again, that's that's people without pre-existing immunity and even people who have some immunity but are still at some increased risk, right? So that would be uh, the elderly, people with multiple comorbidities. We need a way to get them diagnosed and treated quickly. Right now, there are, I can think of two main barriers to that happening, to getting people treated quickly. One is a diagnosis. Um, In most places in the United States, that's still done through a PCR test. So you've got to see a provider or your local health department, which many people don't go for a few days (laughs) until they're feeling sick. Once you have a sample collected, it can take, even if it's very fast, a day or two to get those results back. And then a physician typically has to order, well, for monoclonal antibodies, that's how it works now. A physician has to order that. I know just through recent experience with with family members that that process can take many days. And, you know, for for the antivirals, just as an example, they work if they're given within three days of onset of illness. Right now, we do not have a system (laughs) where we can use those as a public health tool. If we were to focus in on hospitalizations and deaths and how we prevent those, we would have to use those. We would have to figure out how we diagnose people quickly, and how we reduce the barriers to accessing uh, treatments like monoclonals and antivirals. And in my experience, as I, as I just mentioned, you know, I have a loved one who was diagnosed by PCR finally on a Friday. She's elderly. She knew she had been exposed. She had a rapid test positive really early on, but they wouldn't prescribe her monoclonals until she had a positive PCR test. By the time that arrived, it was Friday, and they said, well, we don't give monoclonals on the weekends because, you know, that's just not how we operate here. So you can wait till next week. I mean, this kind of uh, system is just not set up with the strategic goal of preventing hospitalizations and deaths. It seems more like an afterthought, and we've got to put these technologies and, and, and therapies, we've, we've got to maximize their benefit. And there's no way to do that without some reliance on rapid testing. So that means making rapid tests available uh, in every home for free, very easy to get. Um, they're already easy to use. We've got to get those into the mix and we have to reduce barriers to treatment. Colorado is leading the way here in the U.S. Well, in the, I mean, there are examples uh, already of systems doing this. In the U.K., you can get rapid tests at any pharmacy, as many as you want, for free. They're considered a, 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 public, a public health service <laughs> rather than a commercial product. The same now is true in Colorado. You can have rapid tests delivered to your door. And I believe they also um, have waived the requirement for a physician's order for monoclonal therapy. So you can go and, and receive treatment once you have a positive test. 
that's that's a great uh, that's a great strategy that they have going there that is focused on reducing hospitalization and death. So again, it's not that we're we're not we're not expending a lot of effort on our COVID response. We certainly are, but we we are really strategic about where those resources go and 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 to to come up with a strategy where we learn to live with COVID, literally and figuratively, we've got to focus on, on preventing these severe outcomes. And, and our, the, the, the current strategies that we have aren't, aren't going to get us there, I fear. Mm-hmm. You talked about how expensive these things are, and maybe we're focusing on the wrong things. I had a recent experience with contact tracing I wanted to ask you about. Uh, a friend of mine, I went to my book club, and someone tested positive for COVID. Five days later, they got a positive test. So that was Sunday, and Thursday was Thanksgiving. And I got this text as I got off the plane to see my elderly parents. So I stopped the Walgreens and I got a test. I tested myself. I did not have it. I was felt comfortable that I was not going to spread it to my parents and life went on. But when I got home, uh, I believe it was the ninth day after exposure, I got a call from the health department saying I'd been exposed to COVID and I should continue my quarantine another day. So that was the very last thing I was doing. I was not quarantining. And what if I hadn't known? How is that going to help? Right. I mean, the contact tracing, you know, as it, for COVID has so far focused on uh, isolation and quarantine, which particularly early in the pandemic was the best strategy that we had, right? But, you know, contact tracing is used for many other infectious diseases and for many other infections. The point of contact tracing is to notify you that you've been exposed so that you can be screened for that infection, so that you can be treated. And so I think that contact tracing, if we are to agree that, yes, we, we're going to focus in really on hospitalizations and deaths, uh, you know, what's our, how many are we willing to accept and how do we get to that level, um, then contact tracing has to come along with us. Um, so instead of focusing on reaching every contact, you know, and asking them to quarantine, let's let's shift. Let's find the contacts that are at high risk. Let's make sure that they have test kits, that they know they've been exposed. So if they start feeling unwell, they can get treatment right away. At this point, you know, if if we have a strategy where everyone has rapid tests, great. No, you know, we can, like you said, you are notified about your exposure from your contact first, right? If we can agree to tell each other, that's always going to move faster than public health. We got to talk to each other. We have to have rapid tests so that those test results can guide our behavior. I think that people would really um, enjoy feeling that feeling that they they can take matters into their own hands to a certain extent, that they can, they, they feel like they have the power to know, am I infectious today? How does that, you know, change what I do? So that people, you know, can feel like, all right, maybe I've been exposed, but if I get sick, I know that I can test um, and I know where I can get treatment because I'm at high risk. Again, our, our public health effort with this prevent all infection strategy that we have now, uh, is, I, I think is unsustainable. And it, it, it's taking away effort from other very important public health problems that we've put on the back burner uh, because of COVID. So, so if we shift, we can, I think, cover, cover more ground. So this makes a lot of sense to me. Do you see this paradigm shift happening? Not really. Not really. Um, I, I think that there, I've, I've seen more people talking about, you know, what, what should our plans be? <laughs> uh, I, I haven't seen really any moves to articulate, for example, how many hospitalizations from COVID should we be willing to accept and accommodate? I, I haven't really seen discussions about that. that. And that's a serious discussion to have. That's a discussion between healthcare providers elected officials, 
you know, public health, that those are serious, difficult conversations to have. But we have, you know, we have expectations for other diseases. And, and, and there, at some point, there has to be a level that is normal, uh, that is expected, that we, that we work towards. <laughs> you know, maybe that's, that's not the level that we're at right now. Fine. Then what is that level? And, and, and importantly, how do we get there? I fear that without a goal that we can all get behind, we, one, don't know what success means. And then if we don't know what success is, then we definitely don't know when we're there. Emily Garley, thanks so much for joining me. My pleasure. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media support from Grace Holes Fernandez and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening.